our last session, our capstone on systematic reviews. I'll just give you a quick introduction to Marissa. Uh, Marissa Iverson is the research support librarian at the Yukon Health Sciences Library in Farmington, Connecticut, where she is the library's liaison to the School of Dental Medicine and also collaborates on systematic reviews and other evidence synthesis projects. Soon after she became full-time in 2014, she was approached by a dentistry faculty member about doing a systematic review and the rest is history. Since then, she has attended systematic review trainings through the University of Pittsburgh and the University of Michigan. She has co-authored 10 systematic reviews with more in submission. She was honored to be asked to present this capstone session and is excited to share her knowledge and experience this afternoon. So take it away, Marissa. Just a reminder, we are putting questions in the Q&A. Um, if you have links to put in the chat, Marissa, you can do that. Make sure that it's just going out to everyone. And I know you've got some interactive elements as well for us to collaborate with you on. So. All right. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, hi, everyone. Let me go full screen for a sec. Um, like Jennifer said, I'm Marissa Iverson. Uh, oh, there we go. OK. Um, I just want to thank Jennifer and everyone who organized the boot camp for inviting me here. Um, I've been doing systematic reviews for a while now, but this is my first time teaching something like this to librarians, and I'm happy and excited to do it. Um, like Jennifer said, if you have any questions along the way, feel free to put them in the Q&A uh, function in Zoom. I'll get to them at the end. Um, most of my examples today will be within the realm of the health sciences. That's just where I work and what most of my systematic reviews have been on. Um, but you'll find systematic reviews in many other disciplines, um, especially the social sciences, computer science, business, and more. And lastly, PDFs of my slides will be made available uh, sometime after this. Okay, so here are our learning objectives for today. Um, I'm hoping that one hour from now, uh, you'll all be able to uh, describe the overall methodology and steps required in a systematic review. You'll be able to plan for your own level of involvement in a systematic review. Um, you'll familiarize yourself with some of the types of reviews and evidence synthesis. You'll be able to find and reference the important resources in this area um, and also identify opportunities and professional resources that will help further develop your evidence synthesis skills and knowledge. I wanna be clear that this session will not teach you everything you will need to know about doing a systematic review. Um, it'll give you an introduction, but um, you would need much longer than an hour to, to really know how to do them. Um, if you're interested in getting trained in this, I recommend there's lots of webinars out there. There are uh, courses that come up once in a while um, and I would get more professional development in this area, but I'll get you started today. Okay, we're gonna be using a uh, interactive tool called Slido. It's an add-in onto Google Slides. Um, so we're gonna have a couple polls, a couple quizzes along the way to uh, join us on this interactive end of things. Um, you can either use your phone or your browser on your computer, go to slido.com and enter that code, or you can scan the QR code that you see there. Um, one other note about Slido is you will see that there is a Q&A function in Slido. It's just kind of there by default. Please don't submit anything there. I don't have a way to monitor it. Um, no one's going to be checking it. So again, if you have any questions um, for me, use the Zoom version. OK. So we're going to get started with the word cloud. Um, what words come to mind when you think about a systematic review? So I'll give you guys a couple minutes to, not a couple minutes, take 30 seconds to respond. Um, and you can submit uh, multiple responses. Comprehensive is coming across strong. I like that. Complicated, yes. Hard. Grad school. I wish I learned about this in grad school. Give it a couple more seconds. a lot of words you guys are good but com all right comprehensive is coming across very as a very popular term complicated rigorous cochrane reviews yes we'll go over cochrane a little bit difficult oh i can't keep up with them all months of work lots of work team needed yes definitely uh complex yep great okay i'm gonna keep going okay uh now poll how familiar are you with systematic reviews just kind of get a sense of where everyone's at Never heard of them. That's about it. That's fine. 
You know the basics, worked on several. Okay. Okay, so it looks like we have a couple pros here. Um, I hope you learned something from this introduction, but it looks like a lot of people know the basics, haven't worked on one yet. Okay, um, hopefully everything I'm gonna go over kind of reinforces the basics. And if you're completely new to them, I hope you learned something new. Um, and if you're still, if you've worked on a few, you're still learning. Um, me too, I'm always learning. Okay, I'm gonna keep going. So let's get into it. What is a systematic review? Um, to quote the Cochrane Handbook, um, a systematic review attempts to collate all the empirical evidence that fits pre-specified eligibility criteria in order to answer a specific research question. It uses explicit systematic methods that are selected with a view to minimizing bias, thus providing more reliable findings from which conclusions can be drawn and decisions made. Um, if you're not familiar, the Cochrane Handbook is by definition the handbook for how to do a Cochrane systematic review. If, you know, for people who are on a, an official Cochrane team, um, doing one of those giant hundred page reviews. Um, but I find the handbook is a really great resource in general. Um, I refer to it all the time when I'm answering questions about systematic reviews. And I've highlighted a couple important parts here in this definition. Um, so let's unpack these a bit. The first one is that you're going to collate all the empirical evidence. Um, this just gets at the heart of it. Basically, you're trying to find every piece of evidence that's written on a topic and figuring out what it all means when you put it all together. Um, for librarians, for informationists, that means we're searching multiple databases, we're consulting gray literature, which are I define as uh, content that's outside of journal articles like conference proceedings, reports, web content, stuff like that. Um, you're finding everything that's written on a topic, and then you send it off to your team of authors, the content experts, to put it all together, figure it out what it means, appraise, analyze the research, and figure out, once you put everything together, what's the answer. So uh, like a lot of people said in our word cloud, it is comprehensive. You are finding or attempting to find absolutely everything. It is a very large project and it brings in lots and lots and lots of results. I said citations here, but lots of search results, lots of results from your gray lit sources, lots of stuff. Um, you do that, you find everything and you're as comprehensive as possible by identifying keywords and controlled vocabulary relevant to uh, finding articles on your topic. Um, you search multiple databases and sources of Greylit um, to find all evidence available. Uh, I think the Cochrane Handbook says at least three databases. I usually search more than three plus a couple of Greylit sources if I can. Later in the process, you can also consult uh, the cited and citing references of the studies that you end up including in your study. Um, that's a good way to make sure you didn't miss anything. Um, sometimes my authors reach out to the authors of the articles they're using to see if there's any additional data that didn't make it into the paper. Um, you can also do something called hand searching, which you go through manually, preferably uh, an entire journal, you know, every single issue or an entire conference proceedings. Um, you know, if there's one conference on your topic that happens every year, go through all those abstracts and see if anything's in there. Um, yeah, you're trying to be as comprehensive as possible, find everything. Um, you're going, you're using pre-specified eligibility criteria. This means is you make a plan ahead of time and you stick to it. That plan is called a protocol. Um, it, you decide beforehand what's going to be measured, what your question is, how you're going to measure it, and you stick to it, hopefully. Um, it means it's less likely that the authors will be influenced by the results of, uh, that come in or by the systematic review process itself, thus reporting, uh, this avoiding reporting bias. Um, and protocols just in general are really important. It defines your project, uh, it sets your plan, it sets the scope of what you're gonna be doing. And if you choose to publish your protocol, which a lot of people do, there's uh, protocol registries where you can get these online, make them available. You kind of claim your topic, which can be important because systematic reviews can get competitive. You have a specific research question. Systematic reviews work best when your question is clearly defined and specific, not too broad. It's a bit of a balancing act but you're trying to be as specific as possible. If a question is too broad, you're gonna get thousands upon thousands upon thousands of results and it probably won't go much farther than there. I had a team about a year ago that wanted to look at uh, patient reported outcomes uh, out of spinal surgery. Which spinal surgery? All of them. Uh, fusion, yes. Laminectomy, yes. Fracture, yes. What parts of the spine? All of them. I think my first PubMed 
search strategy brought in about 15,000 results. And I didn't hear from them again. Um, I kept pushing them for them to, let's focus on one surgery. Let's focus on one specific outcome. And it kind of uh, died in committee. Yeah. So make your question as specific as possible. Um, it'll just turn out better that way. Uh, you're going to use explicit systematic methods. Uh, this is very pertinent to librarians because we're the ones doing the methods um, for these types of projects. You want them to be transparent and reproducible. So as they used to say in math class, show your work. You're going to be providing your search strategies for all the databases that you're using and the gray literature sources so someone else could do them if they needed to. Um, you have to describe and justify any filters or limits that you're using, provide the database platform, you know, PubMed Medline is different than Ovid Medline, and Ovid Embase is different than Elsevier Embase, so you, can just, you have to say what platform you're using so someone can uh, reproduce it, talk about any software you use for citation management or for screening, and you document and report. Um, there's, a, there's a good list of the required information that you have to keep track of, and that's all in something called Prisma, which I will be referencing a lot, but I will go into it more at the end. And you're trying to minimize bias as much as possible. I think a couple of people put this in the word cloud too. Um, systematic review methodology is systematic, it's comprehensive, and you're trying to pull in as much as possible and not bring any biases or any uh, as few limits or preconceived notions ahead of time as you can. Um, some important biases to consider. Uh, one is reporting bias. So this is when the dissemination of research findings is influenced by the results. So that's why you set the protocol ahead of time. You have your plan, you know what you're doing. You're not gonna change the plan along the way as you actually look at the results that are coming in. Uh, you have to consider publication bias. Publication bias is that positive results tend to get published more often uh, than negative or null results. Um, searching the gray literature kind of addresses that. Uh, negative results might be presented in a conference poster or discussed in a dissertation, uh, maybe not in the journal article. So again, casting a very wide net. Uh, you should try to avoid language bias as much as possible. Um, I'd say most of my review teams would really like to only search for articles in the language they speak, which is English. If you can push against that, please do. There's tons and tons and tons of research in non-English languages. Um, and yeah, don't bring that bias in if you can, but it's, it's hard. Translation is expensive. That's a lot of my teams wanna really wanna do English only. Um, location bias uh, refers to the location of where the article is indexed and what journal it's in. So you work against the location bias in terms of indexing by searching lots of databases um, just because it's not in PubMed doesn't mean it's not worth it. it. You can find it in another database. Um, don't just rely on something like PubMed. Um, location database also refers to the journal itself. Um, so considering, you know, hot, if search in lots of journals, not just the high impact ones, not just the ones you're familiar with, um, look in as many locations as possible. Uh, availability bias is something to consider as well. Um, that is the bias to, find, to only look at articles that are easy to find. Um, interlibrary loan exists for a reason. Uh, we can find things all over the world just because your library doesn't subscribe to it or just because it doesn't come up in Google Scholar um, shouldn't mean you, you exclude it for that reason. Uh, cost is another bias. Um, it would be a bias to only look at free resources or low cost resources. Hopefully you're working in a library that can either has interlibrary loan available or is able to subscribe to, you know, journals and packages and all that and get these resources to your to your uh, teams. Um, the familiar, uh, familiarity bias would be to only look at journals or databases within your discipline. Um, again, cast a wide net, consider lots of sources, different databases, just because it's a health sciences question, don't just consider PubMed, think about other databases as well. And lastly, nationality. Um, this would be only thinking about using articles from high income countries or specific regions. Um, you can try and be as global as possible. Um, sometimes the question requires looking only at one country. I helped a team a couple of years ago that was looking at, um, it was outcomes, um, it, mater it was a maternal health question since the passing of the Affordable Care Act. Well, the United States is the only country with the Affordable Care Act. So in that case, yes, we're only gonna limit it to the United States. Um, but unless there's a justification for it, again, cast a very wide net, see what you find. OK. 
Okay, so now that we've talked about bias, we're going to play a game. It's called What's Your Bias? I wish I had, you know, game show music behind me, but I don't. So back to Slido. Here's a couple examples of um, some biases you might experience as you're helping your faculty. Um, for the quiz, it will ask you to submit a name. Um, you don't have to put your real name. You can say put anonymous. You can just put a letter, a number, maybe an emoji. I don't know. Um, but that's just Slido makes you put a name. I'll just give it a couple minutes for, not a couple minutes, I keep saying that, a couple seconds for everyone to join. Okay, I'm going to move to the question, but if you're still catching up, I think you can join. I like that we just have a librarian. I appreciate that. Hello. <laughs> okay. All right. Your faculty member says, let's only look at articles written in English. We can't afford to hire a translator. Wait for a couple more people to answer. All right. 98%, yes, this is definitely a language bias, correct. Um, translation, uh, professional translation services are incredibly expensive. Um, some systematic reviews, some evidence syntheses are supported by grants. Maybe there's some grant funding to hire an actual translator. If not, I know here at UConn, we have a very diverse multicultural workforce here. My faculty have colleagues from all over the world. Maybe you know someone who speaks the language in the article that, it's, um, that you need. Maybe if you buy them a cup of coffee, they can help translate the methods section or the results for you. If not, um, Google Translate works pretty well. Um, there's another translator tool I use a lot called DeepL. Uh, both Google Translate and DeepL, you can, if you have a readable PDF that's in another language, you can uh, upload the PDF. And I think there's a limit on how many you can do in some time frame, but it can translate entire PDFs, allegedly. Okay. So my point is there's ways around content in another language. It's not your, your own. Okay. Uh, your faculty says, I only want to include articles from journals with good impact factors. This one's a little harder. All right. Just about everyone's answered. Oh, almost. OK. Most people said publication bias. I would consider this location bias. Um, they're considered about where their article is located and what journal. Um, though it could be part of publication bias, too. Um, these are all kind of, they go in and out of each other. Um, but like I said earlier, uh, and as we know, impact factor is not the end all and be all of metrics. Um, it's not necessarily the best way to judge a journal. Um, and where an article is published shouldn't have very much to do with answering your research question. So I, if, it, if a faculty member said this to me, which I've gotten something like this from them, I would say, mm, let's, let's see what we get. <laughs> um, okay. And then last one, um, I didn't include this article because I couldn't find a free PDF of it in Google. It doesn't exist. It's not in Google. All right, we got just about everybody. Yes, this is availability bias. That's what I would call it. Um, we have colleagues in interlibrary loan for a reason. Um, not everything is in Google, as we know. Um, we all know this, our authors might not. Um, and sometimes you do hit a dead end. Uh, I had a review recently that we needed to, I think they're both articles from um, the 1980s from some Czech journal that was no longer published and we could not find a library that owned it. Our ILL librarian exhausted all options and we just had to say, well, we can't find it. So, oh, well, there. Um, when you're reporting stuff in Prisma, there is um, a spot that you can put, you know, 
tried to find full text and could not. It's OK. Um, but not finding it in Google is not a good excuse, in my opinion. All right, thanks for playing. What's your bias? So uh, why do we bother with systematic reviews? There are a lot of work. They're complicated. There's rules. Why are we doing this? Um, they are systematic reviews and evidence synthesis is really the pivot, the connection point between single studies and synthesized research. Um, you have a million studies out there. They're saying different things. A systematic review or evidence synthesis will bring them all together and give you a cohesive um, message, hopefully. Um, I like this quote uh, from some article. I have my references at the end. The most reliable way to identify benefits and harms associated with various treatment options is a systematic review of comparative effectiveness research. Um, evidence synthesis, systematic reviews, these are at the heart of evidence-based care. If you're in the health sciences, uh, this is how we know what works. Um, and they often inform guidelines and policies. Another reason to care about systematic reviews is they're not going away and they probably won't for a while. Um, this is a this is taken from a study in the Journal of Clinical Epidemiology. They looked at the number of systematic reviews and Medline uh, from 2000 to 2019. And as you can see, there are more and more and more every year. Um, the study was published in 2019 and I'm sure this trend has gotten even exponentially larger with the pandemic. You know, when you're working from home, you can't really run a clinical trial, but you can certainly do a systematic review, as I saw with, uh, with my faculty and my residents. Um, yeah, there's lots of them, and there's going to be more and more every single year. Um, however, just because there's a lot of systematic reviews um, doesn't mean they're all good. Uh, they need a librarian. Um, the debate in quality versus quantity. So uh, this is a quote. This first quote is from another article and in the Journal of Clinical Epidemiology, although reporting guidelines and quality assessment tools exist, reporting and methodological quality of systematic reviews are inconsistent. Mechanisms to improve adherence to established reporting guidelines and methodological assessment tools are needed to improve the quality of systematic reviews. Um, but according to another article, um, sorry, according to this article in the journal Systematic Reviews, uh, librarians make systematic reviews better. Um, they, uh, in the study they found they had better uh, um, higher quality search strategies met more of the reporting standards and were more likely to be reproducible. We know how to search the literature. We know how to be organized about it. And authors are in the Cochrane Handbook and other guidelines standards are encouraged to involve a librarian or an informationist. Um, so we know how to do this. We should help. They need us. So how do you do a systematic review? Um, well, before you get started, um, there's, there should be some background research and some background uh, steps first. So you should start your team, usually your authors, your content experts, start thinking about a research question of what they could, um, of a systematic review that they want to do and what could be answered by a systematic review. Um, you should look into the literature, what literature exists on the topic. Is it even, is it you know, high quality? Is it randomized controlled trials? Is it brand new? What is available? Um, you should check to make sure someone else hasn't already done a systematic review. There's no reason to repeat someone else's work, um, unless maybe it's been out of date. Maybe the field has changed since that first systematic review. Does it need to be updated? Um, or maybe it was done badly. Maybe they didn't have a librarian. Um, you can also check uh, protocol registries to make sure someone isn't already working on it. I've had a couple teams that were ready to go, and then I checked Prospero and said, yeah, someone's already, someone's on it pick something else. Um, in the health sciences, you can kind of frame um, some of your background research and, you know, developing your PICO elements, patient intervention, comparison outcome. And you're going to need to assemble a team. A systematic review uh, cannot be done by one person. Um, it requires a team. Usually the team realizes they need a librarian, and that's when you hear from them. Um, so you should have at least three content experts. That's who's going to be screening everything, which I'll explain in a second. Uh, you need an informationist or a librarian who knows what they're doing, um, and possibly a statistician, depending on their analysis, and if, especially if they're doing a meta-analysis. Um, this is a great flowchart. Hopefully, you can see the top one. I realize it's kind of blocked by the Zoom stuff. Um, this is a great flowchart from uh, the citation. Is there? It's from a um, journal article that shows uh, this is this is these are the steps required for a systematic review. Um, so. I forgot what the first one says. Um, I think you would develop your research question. Oh no, that just says task. Those are the labels, sorry. Um, develop your research question, uh, 
do some background research, decide what your topic is going to be, make it specific but not, uh, and not too broad. Um, make sure there's no previous systematic reviews that, that have done this. Uh, you develop your protocol. So your protocol is your plan for what you're going to do, why you're doing it, where you're going to search. Um, you need to develop something called inclusion exclusion criteria. So while you're going through all these uh, results from databases, what's going to tell you if, if you're going to keep something? What's going to be a red flag that you're not going to keep something? You should, the, your team, the content experts should know how they're going to go through your results and make decisions about things. Um, you start devising your search strategies to decide on the databases and how you're going to search them. You run the searches, you deduplicate. Your team screens through the titles and abstracts, usually first of all the results you brought in. You start with everything that passes that first screen, you get the full text, you screen the full text. Uh, and when I say you, I mean the content experts, you're not screening, you're not the content expert. Um, eventually they get to their list of what they're gonna include in their analysis. Uh, it's a good idea to, uh, sometimes it's called snowballing. You find the cited and citing references of those included studies. That's a good way to make sure you didn't miss anything. Um, and then the team, their statistician, they extract the data, they synthesize the data. Um, depending on how long that all takes, you might need to rerun the searches closer to publication. If it took months, if it took a year, it's a good idea to check to make sure nothing new has been published. Um, if they're doing a meta-analysis, they do that, and then you write up the review. So within all these steps, what can a librarian help with? Uh, this is what I think a librarian can help with. Um, basically, all of preparation, um, all of the retrieval, uh, preparation we can advise, we can develop our search strings, we can make recommendations. The retrieval is all us. We know how to search, we know how to export things out of databases, we can manage them, we can deduplicate, and we can get them nice clean, you know, lists of titles, abstracts, PDFs, everything they need. Um, later we can snowball, we can find the cited and citing, we can recheck the literature, and we can help with the manuscript. So I'm just going to go through these steps a bit more in, in detail. So like I said, for in preparation, you can help refine the research question. Um, we are definitely capable of doing preliminary literature searches. What's out there? Does another systematic review exist? What about other protocols? Uh, we can also help with all search related content in the protocol itself. So in your protocol, you should say what databases you're gonna use, if there's any limits, any filters, um, what platforms they're gonna be used on, uh, some semblance of your keywords, any controlled vocabulary. This is all stuff we can do. And you develop those search strings for the databases you're using. I usually start with my PubMed search and then I translate, but because I'm in the health sciences, um, and then I usually translate it um, to all the other databases I'm gonna use. Then uh, we get into retrieval. This is the meat, this is what takes forever. Um, you're gonna run your searches and you're gonna send those results to a citation manager of your choice. Um, you can deduplicate those results. Uh, there will probably be overlap between the databases depending on what you're using. So deduplication is key. Um, and you're gonna have to, you should be documenting everything for Prisma. Um, again, I'm gonna keep talking about Prisma and I'll show it to you at the end, but you know, what date did you search things? Um, what platforms did you use for all your databases? What gray literature sources, sources did you use? What filters, what limits? The number of results, the number of duplicates removed by the citation manager. Uh, Prisma refers to that by automation. The number of duplicates removed by you. Uh, manually, they call it by human, <laughs> um, and then the total number of results that the team is going to screen. Uh, you send those deduplicated results to the team. Uh, I usually send the full uh, an Excel spreadsheet of the full citation with the abstracts. If you have screening software like Providence, you can send them that. If they want an RIS format, you can send them that. That's between you and your team. Retrieval continued once they've screened the titles and abstracts. Uh, depending on your level of service, you can get them the full text records. Um, I know not every library does that for folks. Um, I have no, I do it, I don't mind. Um, maybe you have a technician or an assistant who can help. Maybe they have a grad assistant. Maybe they can do it themselves and they just let you know if they can't find something. Um, but yeah, whatever works for you for your, uh, what your library is used to doing. Later, you can pull the cited citing references of those studies um, being included. I would then deduplicate those against what you already found. No need to rescreen stuff. Um, and then months, year later, uh, you can rerun the searches just before uh, they start getting ready to submit everything just to make sure that nothing new has come out. And again, deduplicate. 
And towards the end for the write-up, um, you were the one who ran the methods. You can definitely prepare all the methods related content for publication. So you can write the methods section. Um, there's something called the Prisma flow diagram that you can put together. Um, and you should also uh, send your team and have you know, nice cleaned up ready, uh, all your search strategies. Prisma says that all your search strategies should be published in the manuscript. And you can also offer to help proofread the manuscript. It doesn't hurt to have another set of eyes looking at it. Um, this is what the Prisma flow diagram looks like. It's a little blurry. This came from one of my papers and I had to, you know, blow it up for the, for the slide. Um, but your, the Prisma flow diagram, you can get this template from Prisma. And this just is a nice visual uh, representation of the whole searching process. So up here are all my databases. Here's the duplicates that got removed. My team screened these. They excluded these. They looked at 61 full text. One was not retrieved. I don't remember why with this one. Um, they looked through 60 and they ended up with 33. And also uh, this one, we looked at a couple different uh, gray resources and uh, they weren't quite, they were a little different than the databases. So I stuck them over here as well as um, bibliographies and forwards. And they wanted to look at the references of reviews found in database results. I'll get back to why um, for that one in a second. But like I said, the Prisma flow diagram, you have all these numbers, you know how many results you pulled, you know how many duplicates you found, you can put this together. And this is key for getting this, for getting a systematic review published. Um, you can also put together something like this. This one is not the final version, hence all the little, you know, Microsoft Word angry un, <laughs> angry red lines, um, but you wanna get somewhere, you wanna put where all your search strategies um, are in one place. Uh, Prisma wants all of these published. I like to put um, when it was last searched, here are all my databases, here's the platform, um, here's my search string. Uh, I don't think, oh yeah, I used a human limit in CINAHL, so I know that. I used uh, not books in Web of Science and here are all my results. So this should be somewhere in your uh, manuscript, maybe in the article itself, it's oftentimes as a supplement. Okay, so now that I've gone through all these steps, what do you think at this point today you'd be comfortable doing? You can, oh, and you can select multiple uh, responses. Okay, as more answers come in, this is about what I expected. Yeah, we are we are pros at literature searches. You can definitely help with preliminary literature searches, making a good search strategy, running searches. Yeah, a lot of the preparation stuff is very, you know, librarian consultation esque or lit search assistance related. Um, Deduplication, you just got to get to know a citation manager. Um, or there's uh, there's some automation tools out there too, like. Um, the Systematic Re Review Accelerator has a deduplication function too, if you don't have access to a good citation manager. Um, okay, and snowballing, I honestly, I just use Scopus half the time um, or Google Scholar if it's not in Scopus or pulling the PDF and going through the bibliography one by one if it's not indexed fully. Um, yeah, okay, so this will give you an idea of, you know, there's a lot of things that you can already do. Um, you're not at square one. Um, and what you what you didn't answer, those are things that you can look for trainings on, or you know, that's where that's where your professional develop, development opportunities lie. Okay. Uh, one more thing to consider when thinking about librarian involvement in a systematic review is how much you're willing to do and how much you can do. Um, what I do, what a lot, a lot of libraries do too, and you can definitely uh, take this for your own institution too, is you th I think about the level of amount, the amount of work I'm about to do in a systematic review, am I doing it as a consultant or as a co-author? And there's a difference. And I ask my teams this right at the onset, like how much work do you want me to do on this? So as a consultant, I do preparation. I can help with uh, helping with designing the research question. I can definitely search for systematic reviews that already exist. Uh, I can weigh in a little bit on the protocol, you know, recommend some databases, and I am happy to make search strategies for them. 
And then I hand it off to them. I give them a search strategies. I say, copy and paste this into your databases and let me know if you have any questions. And that's it. Um, I might hear from them for if they haven't used a citation manager before, of course, I can you know, train them on how to use one of those. Um, I might hear from them about, you know, I can't find this PDF, it doesn't exist. And I'm like, okay, well, we have interlibrary loan, here you go. Um, but other than that, I, I help them with the preparation and I'm hands off from there. It doesn't take too much time. Um, for this level of, of involvement, if they, if they put me in the acknowledgement section, that's lovely, thank you, but I don't expect too much. On the other hand, co-author is all the boxes I had before. I am a full member of the team. I'm doing everything from preparation, all aspects of retrieval, um, and helping write up the manuscript. If, okay. if um, you're doing everything possible to make this review a success, you are a full member of the team. You have, they are getting your full level of collaboration. Um, you're helping with preparation running the searches, everything. You were a full member of the team. And for this level, you should be a co-author and they should, sometimes it takes some negotiating, but um, there are guidelines on there on what merits, what amount of involvement merits co-authorship. And if you're doing all of this, you should be a co-author. Um, yeah, they wouldn't have the systematic review without you. So that's where I stand on it. Um, and like I said, these are the two models that I use. Um, feel free to use them. A lot of people use that too. or change it, modify it for however works for your institution and for what you're capable of. And I get asked pretty often, how long does it take to take to do a systematic review? I think we said that in the word cloud too. It's it's a very time consuming project. Um, yeah, this table is from a previous uh, version of the Cochrane Handbook. Um, and as you can see, considering everything, considering screening, considering all your uh, analysis, it can take a year or more. Um, Depending on the scope of your question, it you could get it done in a couple months. I had one, I had a couple really niche orthodontics topics that we've gotten done in maybe six months, but they, they didn't have the much to screen because it was such a small amount of, it was such a small topic. Um, and then I had one uh, on uh, risk factors for readmission in pediatric asthma from my first meeting with the first, from the, from my first meeting with the lead author until publication, it took three years. So it varies. Okay. Um, another part of the preparation and the background research is matching the question that your research, the research question that your authors want to do with the appropriate type of review. I've been talking about systematic reviews for the past 36 minutes. Um, a systematic review is technically, it's just one type of evidence synthesis. Evidence synthesis is the umbrella term for any type of project that pulls together lots of evidence and, and analyzes it, synthesizes it all together. So there are other types of reviews. There's other types of evidence synthesis. Um, if you get a research question that doesn't, that doesn't really seem right for a systematic review, there are other options out there and it's good to familiarize yourself with these um, but there's other flavors of reviews so you can uh, make recommendations to your faculty. So I'm just gonna go through a couple of the ones that uh, I've seen a lot. So the first one is a meta-analysis. Um, a systematic review, it's a, a meta-analysis is usually a systematic review plus more statistical analysis of the included studies data. Um, they usually go together. Uh, I think technically a meta-analysis could be done without a systematic review, but I don't, I've, I've never seen that. Um, not all systematic reviews have the meta-analysis. It's an extra step. It's more analysis. You really need a statistician for this. That's kind of the high end of the evidence spectrum. On the other end, we have uh, a narrative or a literature review. You usually see these. Uh, they can be standalone articles. You Sometimes you see them. Oftentimes you see them as, you know, the first part of an article with all the background research. There is, there's no standardization here. There's no protocol there's no way to, they're not reproducible or transparent at all. They usually have a very wide scope, uh, no set methodology, no protocol. Um, what, how did they find the articles? We don't know. What were their search strategies? Question mark. Um, did they use limits? Did they only look back at articles only going back to 10 years? Maybe, who knows? Um, so as we know, these get published, but uh, their level of evidence, the level of rigor, the, the, it's, it's nothing compared to a a meta-analysis. 
Um, still helpful, still good, still great to learn a topic, but different than a meta-analysis. Other types of reviews. Uh, you'll see scoping reviews come up pretty often. These are very popular right now. Um, you usually do the same systematic methodology, but it's for a broader question. Uh, they often look for gaps in the literature or try to categorize or map the nature and extent of the evidence that's available. Um, they might report on the type of evidence that's out there, what needs to be done, you know, the future of research in this area. Uh, they should kind of report on what's ongoing. So look at you know, current trials. We have scoping reviews don't necessarily ask a specific question. They just kind of analyze uh, a world of, of evidence and on a topic um, and kind of talk about it from a higher level up. Um, my favorite one, I haven't worked on one yet, and I really want to, is an umbrella review, which is a review of systematic reviews. I love that that exists. Um, there's so many systematic reviews out there that we can review all of them together. Um, these are really helpful for really broad topics that have a lot of existing systematic reviews. Um, they're good for comparing interventions uh, for you know, the same condition or something or comparing various risk factors. Um, yeah, so that's an option. If there's already a lot of systematic reviews, why not do an umbrella review? Um, a rapid review is uh, basically a systematic review on a time crunch. Um, the Prisma flow diagram that I brought up before that we searched all types of things that I wouldn't normally have done. Um, this was for a journal that was expecting, they were doing a special issue on um, on the topic. I'm not going to give it away because we have a quiz coming up. Um, and it was kind of a time sensitive matter. Um, so they're often used for uh, for policy um, or for yeah other kind of time crunches. Um, you use the same basic systematic review methodology. You might not use as many resources or you could pull references from already published reviews and just kind of get those in to make sure it, you, you can use other kind of time saving considerations, maybe not search as comprehensively. Um, but yeah, it's just kind of trying to get it done quickly um, because of outside matters. And the last one I want to mention is a systematized review. Um, I recommend this one a lot. So uh, basically it's a, it has most of the elements of a systematic review. You're still doing pretty comprehensive search. You're still screening. You're still, still doing analysis, but it lacks the same rigor as a full systematic review, and that's because they're usually done by a single lone graduate student. So I get all the time medical students coming in saying, I want to do a systematic review for my capstone project, or hmm, I have the summer free, I want to do a systematic review. A single medical student cannot do a systematic review. I don't know how many times I've told them that. I don't know how many times I've told faculty advisors that, but I can usually get them to agree to a systematized review once I kind of once I kind of explain what a systematic review is, what it isn't, that you need a team, and this is an option. Um, so yeah, the definition is literally, it's done by a single graduate student. So this is a great option for those very intrepid students. Um, there are other review types out there. Uh, if you want more information on other reviews, other evidence synthesis, these are the two articles I refer to the most, Grant and Booth's 2009 Typology of Reviews, as well as a newer one uh, by Sutton et al, Meeting the Review Family. We have one more uh, interactive section. We're gonna pick the review type. So I think, I don't think you have to rejoin the quiz if you're already in it, but just telling you to get ready. So prepare yourselves. Okay, situation number one. A group of faculty members want to write a review on the environmental risk factors for inflammatory bowel disease. You suggest you find that many systematic reviews and meta-analyses already exist. So you suggest that they do a Just waiting to see if a couple more people want to venture a guess. All right, I'm gonna keep going. Umbrella review. <gasps> yes, I would I would definitely recommend an umbrella review for this. Um, and actually this was based on an umbrella review I found in PubMed on this exact topic, uh, environmental risk factors for IBS. Okay. 
to your residents and their faculty mentor want to explore and categorize the genomic evidence available on craniosynostosis, you suggest doing a blank. All right, now let's see. Scoping review, that is exactly what I told them to do. This is one I'm working on right now. Um, and yeah, they started wanting to do a systematic review. And then once they actually explained kind of what they're looking for, I said, that sounds like a scoping review to me. So that's what we're going with. Okay. A third year medical student wants to do a systematic review for their capstone project. You suggest they do a blank. Let's see. Yes, a systematized review. The answer to all my, my woes with medical students. Yes, um, he's by himself. He or she is by himself, by themselves. Uh, and, you know, a capstone, at least here at UConn, is a multi-year project, but they're students. They have boards. They have exams. There's no systematized every time. Okay. Your state is considering legalizing the use of recreational marijuana. A team of your faculty have been asked to weigh in on how this could affect teens. They reached out to you about doing an evidence synthesis and you suggest that they do a blank. All right, let's see how you answer this. A rapid review, yes. I, I think really you could you could do a systematic review on this topic and a meta-analysis potentially, um, but the key here is that I included the state was asking for this. So there are kind of outside stakeholders that don't have years to wait for your faculty to come back with an answer. So in this case, it's time sensitive. It's related to policy. Uh, it needs to be done quickly. Probably a rapid review would be good. All right, a couple more. A team of orthodontics fellows and residents are writing review on the amount of root resorption when using traditional braces versus clear aligners. You suggest that they do a blank. All right, let's see how you guys answered. Systematic review and meta-analysis. Yep, that's exactly what we did. Um, this is a very clear research question um, with trial data, clinical data, uh, enough data that yes, this is a lot of these are based on ones I've done. Um, yep, we did a meta-analysis and it went very well. Okay, I think this is the last one. A team of public health researchers are investigating how social determinants of health affect those with congenital heart defects. You suggest they do a blank. see. We could have done a narrative review. We turned this into a systematic review. Um, it was, it was, this one was tricky. This one was a bit more of a broad question. Um, and we ended up focusing on a couple different uh, social determinants. 
not every single one. Um, but yeah, this one could have gone in a couple different ways. So if you said narrative review, that's okay. Um, but we ended up, this was a systematic review uh, ultimately. Oh, and I forgot. Yes, yeah, Lido is going to tell us who won. So um, go, Louise. Good job. <laughs> and and uh, Honoré mentions to Carolyn. Hello, Sean and PB. Well done. Okay. Um, we're going to wrap up. I've got about 10 minutes left. Um, so some of the top resources to uh, utilize, to learn more, to refer to um, are the ones I have here. Um, I don't quite have time to go into every single one, but I will show you Prisma when we get there. So the first one, uh, uh, I mentioned already the Cochrane Handbook. Like I said, it's technically the handbook for doing a Cochrane review, um, but it's really helpful for any review. It has recommendations and instructions for just about every step of the way. Uh, the Institute of Medicine Standards, or Finding What Works in Healthcare, is a set of standards uh, for every step of a medicine-specific um, systematic review. Um, again, similar to the Cochrane Handbook, um, just every step of the of the process is outlined and and is there and you can reference it and when you get questions about it those two sources are there for you the jbi manual which is the joanna briggs institute uh, manual for evidence synthesis it's still rooted in healthcare but it's a bit more multidisciplinary um, and it has recommendations for systematic reviews on different topics it also has guidance on umbrella reviews scoping reviews and other review types as well and then Prisma, which I've been talking about a ton. I'm just gonna go over to it real quick. Oops, there we go. Um, so Prisma is, I probably visit Prisma at least three times a week. I refer to it constantly. It is the preferred reporting items for systematic reviews and meta-analyses. Um, this is what tells you what you need to document and what you need to report when you write up your systematic review. Um, for me, it's, I just, Prisma tells me to do it and I do it. Um, and there's checklists that you can follow. Um, and there's also the Prisma flow diagram templates. So you don't have to build that figure I showed you from scratch. You can download their word template. Uh, I think there's also an app for it. I haven't used the app, but um, yeah, they make it very easy. Uh, the checklist tells you what needs to be put into uh, your manuscript. And they also have uh, checklists or they call them extensions. Um, for uh, other aspects of systematic reviews and other reviews as um, review types as well. So there's a Prisma for abstracts, what needs to go into your abstract. There's one for protocols, what needs to be put into your protocol for scoping reviews. And there's even one for searching as well. So kind of how you need, what you need to write up about your search process. And the last uh, resource I want to mention is the systematic review toolbox. Uh, this is a online resource of um, there's one section of guidelines that you can find using it. And there's also a whole section of software. So you tell it um, what aspect of the methodology you're working on, what type of review work you're working on, and for software, what price you're looking for. If you're looking for free, if you have some money to spend, and it recommends uh, software uh, and tools to, to meet what you're looking for. I didn't really have time today to go into all the different tools that are available, but the systematic review toolbox is great for that. If you want to learn more about doing systematic reviews, if it's part of your job, if it's going to be part of your job, if you want it to be part of your job, um, these are some of the resources I came across and that I can recommend. So uh, first up, there is a Coursera MOOC, uh, Massive Online Course, I'm missing an O in there, um, through Johns Hopkins. That's an introduction to systematic reviews and meta-analysis um, that is free through Coursera. Um, there is, uh, through the University of Minnesota, if you are not in the health sciences, there is a Evidence Synthesis Institute. Um, it is free for uh, those who participate. Applications are being accepted through June 13th. There are also various recorded recordings and uh, videos and webinars that you can watch. A really good one I liked recently is from the Therapeutics in Initiative at the University of British Columbia. Uh, systematic review searching and overview of best practices in real world experience. The therapeutic uh, initiative, if you get on there, uh, if you get start getting their email alerts, they have a lot of webinars and a lot of them are really helpful. Um, there's also a webinar series through Cornell and there's a video series uh, specific to searching through Yale's medical library. Um, those were all the free ones. These are the not free ones. Uh, the University of Michigan systematic review workshop is one I did. Um, if you're interested in using them go on their website and poke around i it looks like there is an in-person version and an online version for the in-person you 
apply to be in the lottery and those selected from the lottery, it costs $100 only, but then you need to get to Ann Arbor and get your accommodations and food and flights and all that. Um, it looks like there is an online component, but I couldn't tell what the process is for getting into that, but you, um, all my slides will be PDFs with links and you can click on them and go look at this if you're interested. The Medical Library Association also recently uh, released a systematic review services specialization. It is $760 for MLA members and a little over a thousand for non MLA members. So that's an option. Um, Cochrane also has its own interactive learning videos. Um, I think these are incredibly expensive, but depending on your institutional license and your institutional access, you might have access to these. Um, or maybe you have money to spend on them. And really helpful professional networks that I recommend if you want to learn more about this and be involved in them. Um, the ACRL Evidence Synthesis Methods Interest Group is wonderful. They have a great listserv. They just started a new mentee mentor program. You can sign up in either role. Um, I, th I think it's brand new. I don't know if anyone's been paired up with it yet, but it doesn't hurt to sign up and see what happens. Um, the Medical Library Association also has a systematic review caucus um, and a user experience caucus. The user experience caucus is doing some really cool stuff with uh, getting into the weeds of searching and reusing all the different databases that we use, you know, really efficiently and effectively. Um, yeah, those are both great groups. And the expert searching listserv, which I'm pretty sure you don't have to be an MLA member to join. I could be wrong there. Um, but yeah, all of these groups, all of their listservs are just wonderful for learning about uh, upcoming webinars, training opportunities, people ask questions, that questions get answered. It's it's really great. And um, they all have the option to sign up as a digest so you don't get a million emails, you just get one daily email. Um, but yeah, all of these groups I find incredibly helpful. Okay, that's it. Um, here's my contact information. Uh, if you have any questions, like I said, I see some stuff in the Q&A. Um, feel free to reach out. That's my email, that's my phone number. Um, I've also provided the link to my LibGuide on systematic reviews. I'm still working on it, but um, just about everything I talked about there is, to, everything I talked about today is in there somewhere. It also has more databases, graylet sources, and tools that I didn't have the chance to get into. Um, and those are my references. So. Okay. Thank you, Marissa. All right, let's take a quick look at the questions. Um, actually, the first one put in was a link to a, well, a citation about an article about low cost sources of translation. Okay. I'm going to just put that in the chat so yeah, people can great. reference that. Um, there's a comment about location bias. Um, this person says, thinking of it as more of where the search is actually performed. Um, there's a link here to saying sometimes it's suggested that your search results depend on your location. Okay. Um, I will put that in the chat as well. I was taking that from uh, when I did the University of Pittsburgh course. Mm -hmm. We have one, I have one set of slides on different biases and that's how they had defined location and they didn't have a citation for it. So mm -hmm. um, all of these, there's multiple definitions of. Let's see. We had a question about the difference between a literature review and a systematic review. I think you covered that. Um, if there's still questions about that, go ahead and put another question in. Um, actually, I really like this next question about, have you run across the problem of retracted studies coming up in results? Um, there's a note that Zotero and EndNote now include screening from Retraction Watch, so it's easier to find them. Um, but that's a great question. That is a great question. Um, I have not let me think. And I don't, so here at UConn, we don't have EndNote. Um, I use RefWorks and I don't think they have that functionality. So that's a great point. Um, yeah. I know, I would hope that if we got to the full text stage at one point, at some point when I went to go find it or when they went to go find it, we'd see a giant, you know, red bar that says this has been retracted. Um, but yeah, that's a real concern. Yeah. Um... Question about, have you found any surprises with the new PubMed search algorithm that it was out as of May, 2020? And there's a link to an article here. It looks like it's in Spanish, but my Google was trying to translate it for me. So I'll put that in the I, chat. I know things have changed with the automatic term mapping. Um, when I do a PubMed search, I put a label on everything. I usually use text word. Um, and I think that makes it do what I want it to do. Um, I did find, I have one, I have one scoping review that I hear from them like on an annual basis and then that drops off the face of the earth and then they get back to me and say like, oh, we want to finish it this year. <laughs> um, and that's been going on so long that 
my, the amount of results pre new PubMed versus new new PubMed um, changed surprisingly, and I, I don't really know why, but they're screening everything in the new one now, and and I'm okay with that. All right. Um... Oh, thank you to the person who noticed that the stuff wasn't popping up in the chat because I was sending it to hosts and panels only. So I will resend those links. Um, I'm going to ask Marissa this next question. How many are you working on at one time on average? And what do you do if someone asks for your help with a review, but you don't have time? I, um, I'll answer the second question first. I tell them they are on a wait list and I estimate about when I'll get back to them. Um, up until about a month ago, I had a couple other colleagues that were working on these as well. So if I was really swamped, I could ask um, my colleagues if they had time, um, if the authors weren't willing to wait. One of those colleagues has since retired and the other one is, he's, he's my supervisor and we're all really busy hiring people. Um, so right now I just say, you gotta wait. Um, and if they're not okay with that, then, I mean, they can do a systematic review without you. I would hope that it, they would do it with me, but um, most of the time they're, they're understanding, especially since here in, at UConn, uh, there's like a wave of retirements right now. So everyone's kind of aware of it. Um, how many do I work on at one time? I always, everything is in one, I can only really manage one in each stage. So um, I'll usually have a couple that are kind of in the preparation mode and I'll hear from them as they like, oh, here's the latest draft of the protocol. What do you think? And I say, okay, now let's talk about databases. So usually there's a couple that are kind of percolating there. Um, I focus on the retrieval end for one, one at a time. Um, that's mostly because I use RefWorks and I like to have one set of things in RefWorks so they're not deduplicating across multiple databases. There was a while that um, our orthodontics program is very research heavy and I'd have multiple orthodontics systematic reviews going at the same time. And that was just bad. Um, so I'm, I'm running searches and I'm deduplicating for one at a time. And then once I send the clean set of deduplicated results to one team, then I can get to the next one. Okay. Um, I'm going to note that we are at time. Um, if you have time for just a couple quick more questions. I have nothing else today. So okay. Um, there was just a quick note that Google Scholar was country specific. Hmm. Um, and that also the retraction notices don't always come up in PDFs in the databases. So a couple of yeah. important points. I don't have a good way to, other than yeah. switching to EndNote and getting you kind of paper. Yeah. Or, uh, last yeah. looks like hopefully the last question. We'll see. Can you include systematic reviews in your systematic review without it being an umbrella review if it's related, but not exact to the topic? I mean, Technically you could, I think it's not advisable. Um, Cause if, I don't know. Cause if it asked a different question than what you're researching, then why would it show up? And if it is the same question, then if it's old, I mean, if, it, if it's a recent well done systematic review, I don't see why you would include it cause you should be asking something different. Um, but you can, um, if it's, I'd say if it was a scoping review, if it was not a systematic review, not a meta-analysis, it would probably make more sense. Um, and you can certainly cite older systematic reviews too, you know, that yeah. if you took you know, inspiration from something else. Great. Okay. I think that was our last question. Okay. So thank you, Marissa, for your wonderful capstone. Um, and thank you to our attendees for your attention today. Thank you to our virtual hosts from WPI and UMass Chan and Holy Cross and to Yukon Health Center for Marissa. Um, we will be sending out a feedback survey. And I think probably the easiest thing to do is we'll send the PDF of Marissa's talk out as well. Um, and you will also get an attendance certificate, which we try to do to mimic what we were doing for in-person boot camps, where you would actually get a little button pin with a, an icon on it. Um, we have virtual buttons for you. Um, I think that's the other, oh, one other thing. Um, if you're not currently part of the boot camp planning committee, but you think your library, your institution might potentially either want to join the committee um, or potentially host in the future, there's a note on the feedback form. Um, you can get back to us about that. There is a cost to join the planning committee. Um, we've been kind of downgrading that the last couple of years, but I think we're going to be coming back to asking for sponsorship costs as part of 
being part of the planning committee. But if that's something you think your library is interested in, um, get in touch with us and we can talk about it. Um, I think that's all. So thank you all for your very